Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Monday, this 26th day of April. Oh my goodness. I can't believe we're about to be four months deep into 2021. It's pretty amazing how quickly the world is moving and evolving daily as we move into economic recovery and <clears throat> reset recovery bound here with the Hispano Chamber of Commerce. My name is Shannon Hawkins, and I'm really excited to have you guys joining us today, along with a great great panel as we continue our adventure into all of the city departments and learning about the different departments and what they do, how they can help the community and possibly even your small business. And so uh, we have a great panel with us today, but a uh, big shout out to the city of Albuquerque uh, for partnering with us on this venture, as well as the mayor's office. And of course, all of the little elves behind the scene, um, Stacy uh, Drangmeister for helping us get all of this set up. And of course, Angelique and our marketing team for helping us get going on the technical side of things as we all still learn how to using, I'm still learning how to use Zoom. I, I talk when I'm muted all the time. So, uh, but <clears throat> today we've got a great panel. We're actually gonna be speaking with um, some folks that are gonna give us a deep dive into their departments. And I'm really excited about this conversation. So I hope you guys grab a sack lunch and beverage and let's spend the next hour getting to know uh, these individuals. So I'm just going to start in the order as you appear on my screen and we will start with your name and title and what department you are representing and then we're going to start the conversation. So Stephanie, you are up. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And thanks for the invite. Um, I have to just say up front that Councillor Cynthia Borrego is, uh, I apologize, she wasn't able to make the meeting. Um, my name is Stephanie Ada. I am the director of the Council Services Department for the City of Albuquerque. Uh, I oversee um, the City Council staff and office, and I also I report directly to the nine councilors through the president of the council. Um, our department is pretty unique to all the other departments you've probably met because we are, uh, we do have a separate goal or a separate charge from the mayor's office. Of course, the council is the legislative body of the city. And so there's a separation between us uh, that way, uh, but we do sit in city hall. We're on the ninth floor here. Um, lots of other stuff I can talk about what we do to support businesses um, and how the counselors help. So. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Looking forward to this conversation. Uh, Mr. Sidabaka. See? Myself. Now who's learning how to use learning Zoom? Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a slow learner. Hey, uh, thank you. I'm Ernie Sidabaka, President and CEO of the Albuquerque Spinal Chamber. And, you know, uh, back, I used to work for PNN. Uh, some time back and uh, had a 36, 37 year old uh, year career there. But I uh, started getting involved in the early 90s in governmental affairs for PNN and then rose to be their vice president. But the first assignment I had was with the city of Albuquerque's city council, because at that time, PNM had a, not a very great relationship with the city of Albuquerque and especially with the city council. So it'll be kind of fun to reminisce some of that things during this conversation. Uh, back in the days, Eldon Marr was a guy I think that, that was running council services. I don't know if you guys ever remember him or heard of him, but then Mark Sanchez and others. But anyway, I can't, there was a woman in between. I can't remember as well, but looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Ernie. Ethan, you're next. Thank you. Um, my name is Ethan Watson. I'm the city clerk with the city of Albuquerque. Our department um, is in Plaza del Sol on the seventh floor. Uh, we have a range of responsibilities for, I think the three big areas are um, hearings, administrative appeals and hearings, records management, and responding to public records requests under our Inspection of Public Records Act. And so we do engage with a wide um, number of people across the city and also across the business community. And I look forward to this discussion. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of fun over the last few weeks getting to know all the different departments and really understanding uh, what your mission is within city government 
and how you help uh, the, the public and also small businesses and some of those uh, missions and some of those initiatives that you're doing. So Stephanie, I think is just going to be great to start with you to kind of start, if you could tell us a little bit about maybe the history of city council, the mission of city council, and um, you know, is there any key personnel we need to know about? Maybe the counselors themselves, what districts they represent, and uh, let's kind of break down the department of city council. Sure, thank you. So the city council in its uh, current version was created, I think, in 1974 um, by city charter. Um, it is a, the, our city is a, what they call strong mayor form of government. So um, the mayor is responsible for administrating all the departments and the programs. The council is responsible for appropriating money to run those programs. And the council is also responsible for land use issues. So they're the final, they're the appellate body for land use issues and they set those policies. Um, so um, like I mentioned, I, I am the director here. Uh, we have about, including the counselors, almost 40 employees. Um, we have nine counselors. Uh, they are based on, the council districts are currently based on the the work that was done after the 2010 census. Um, the council actual will be taking up a redistricting uh, effort to come starting this summer uh, with the 2020 census coming out. So um, we have nine counselors. Uh, there are three districts uh, east of the, uh, I'm sorry, west of the river. So uh, district three is the southwest area. That's Councillor Clarissa Pena. Um, District one is more in what we would call like the Mes West Mesa area from the South Valley to about Montano. Uh, that's council district one. And Councillor Lansena is currently the counselor there. She was appointed to that district by the mayor uh, after our, our colleague, Councillor Sanchez passed away. Um, she, her term ends uh, in December as does Councillor Pena's. Um, the third district on the west side is uh, District 5, which is currently Councillor Borrego. That's the far north west heights and, and next to Rio Rancho. And she also is serving till the end of this uh, December. They will need to uh, actually get reelected into their positions. The east side of the river has all of our other districts. So um, the downtown district is what we kind of call it, but district two is Councillor Isaac Benton. And that kind of runs through the whole middle of the incorporated uh, part of the city. So from Barelas all the way to the far North Valley on fourth. Um, Councillor Davis is in Councillor Dis Council District six, which is the UNM and Knob Hill uh, Kirtland area or the part of Kirtland. Um, yeah, of course, that's the international district um, because of the presence of a lot of different uh, uh, ethnicities there. Um, Council District 9 is what we call the Four Hills area, kind of the, the far southeast heights, and that would be Councillor Don Harris. Councillor Harris has uh, decided to retire this year. So his seat will be up. He will serve until the end of December and then somebody will take his place. Um, then kind of just, a, I guess, north of uh, the International District and, and, and kind of uh, District 9 is what we call the Midtown District. It's Council District 7 that is currently Councillor Diane Gibson. And she has also stated that she will be retiring from the council this year. So that is another seat that will be open uh, uh, come January. Uh, two other districts in are, are the far Northeast Heights districts, Council District 8, which is Councillor Trudy Jones. And she's more along the Sandias uh, adjacent to Councillor Harris's district. And the last district is Council District 4, which is in the far, far Northeast Heights, the kind of the La Cueva area. 
And currently that is Councillor Brooke Basson who uh, got elected after our longtime Councillor Winder retired. So those are our current districts. The, um, the redistricting effort will maintain nine districts. However, it's likely that the boundaries will be changed and that's based on uh, population of the, uh, in, within those districts. Um, just want to mention too, uh, the redistricting effort uh, involves a committee of members who are appointed by the councillors and they recommend map maps to the councillors for um, to uh, adopt. So that's a kind of a lengthy process. Well, I have to tell you, Stephanie, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of change at the end of this year. <laughs> As I'm taking my notes, I'm, I'm going, wow, wow, wow. Um, so it's interesting because this is kind of like a heads up, you know, to be paying attention because there's going to be people running in these districts. Right. I definitely think we should talk about that in a little bit. We'll bring Ernie in on that conversation for sure. Um, but it's going to be important because these are the counselors that set a lot of um, you know, like you said, whether it's land use or allocation of monies for the city of Albuquerque. So it's important you know who's running, what they stand for, what they support, so that when you're voting, you are an informed voter. So let's definitely talk about that here in just a bit. Um, Ethan, I want to bring you into this conversation. It's kind of the same question. You know, what is the mission? Tell us a little bit of a history of the department, any key people that are part of this department, and uh, yeah, help us break it down. Thank you. And um, actually, elections are a great segue to one function that I forgot to mention at the outset, which is um, the city clerk's office does oversee um, the city's elections. Um, although we don't manage the actual voting um, after the city opted into the Local Election Act, um, the county clerk now manages voting. But um, for people participating in the election, candidates participating and MFCs that are participating, um, we regulate their conduct and review their um, campaigns finance reports. And so we do often get questions from um, business groups about if they're interested in um, doing political advertising or anything like that. And so I, I would say, you know, for people who are interested in that um, or, or have questions about it, please don't hesitate to contact our office um, because we're happy to um, orient people to our rules really at any time. Um, in a, another part of the election piece that we manage is the city's public finance program, um, which is really one of the most robust in the state. And uh, we often engage with the public about that as well. Um, we have two other main areas within our office. The second one is hearings. Uh, we hear appeals under uh, numerous city ordinances for um, any time there's any administrative appeal. Uh, with the exception of land use, which is our, obviously goes through council and there's a slightly different process around those. Uh, we hear hearings on um, uniform housing code violations, numerous um, things around um, animal, animal issues. And I'm trying to think, there's about 89 different ordinances that we hear appeals on. It's a lot. Um, and I can't, um, old, the Old Town Portal appeals, that's one of my favorite ones that actually doesn't come up that much because that's why I think it's so interesting, but we um, we do hear appeals from those permits. And so I, I think if you ever have questions around um, appealing a certain, if you're a permit or something like that, you're please again, feel free to contact our office. The final area we have is um, really just revolves around records, both records management for um, the city, which doesn't really impact the public that much, but we also respond to public records requests on behalf of all city departments um, other than the city council. Um, and through that, we engage with a whole range of different businesses um, throughout the city, including um, one of our biggest types of requests really is related to planning and permitting because we receive a large number of um, environmental site assessments and different types of requests related to permits. And um, people really can obtain a lot of that information online now through our office and we work to um, provide it to them as quickly as possible. Um, and so those are uh, basically the three big areas where we engage with people um, is hearings, records and elections. Uh, we have about 23 employees and uh, because we're a small department, um, there is a lot of overlap um, in, in functions and roles. And so I would encourage if um, 
you know, if you have a specific question, I would just contact our main number 924-3650 and um, we can, you know, get you where you need to go. So we had a great conversation last week with 311. <laughs> I'm guessing they filled a lot of a lot of uh, questions for both of your departments. Uh, they, they were really, really great. So that's awesome. And we have your number. We'll make sure that it's available to everybody as well um, to fill for questions, of course. Now, I'd love to get back to talk a little bit about, you know, how uh, the landscape of city council changes, you know, how often it changes. So kind of to, to start this off, Stephanie, tell us a little bit about the terms, how long they serve for. And then, you know, Ernie, I'd love for you to jump in after Stephanie. Let's talk a little bit about what might be happening in the upcoming months to uh, the new year uh, in city council. So Stephanie. Yeah, thanks, Janet. So, um, the count, there's nine counselors, like I said. Counselors, uh, per the charter, serve four-year terms. There's no current limit on the terms for counselors. Um, so they could keep on going as long as they keep getting elected. Um, let's see. Um, so the elections are staggered so that the full council isn't elected in one year. So um, we're currently in the odd even districts are being elected this year and then in two years it will be the uh, um, the even number and it, and so on um, the counselor's salary uh, is actually set by a independent salary commission that is overseen by our uh, the city's accountability and government oversight committee it's or that they refer to it as AGO and that is um, administered by the internal audit department um, here at the city. So there's a committee that meets and reviews what the counselors and actually the mayor do and they set their salaries. Um, I think they're, they're actually meeting this summer um, and or are currently and they should have a recommendation, a new recommendation for those salaries. Um, That's interesting, I never knew that. <laughs> yeah, so, and like I said, uh, you know, of course, counselors can get elected through election. Um, as I mentioned, Councilor Shanda was actually appointed. So in the case when there's a somebody, we lose a counselor for whatever reason that is not related to an election, um, the mayor actually at that time gets to appoint uh, a person to fill out that term. And that's where we got Councilor Senna. Um, I don't know any other specific questions about about all that. I hope I answered your question. Well, Ernie, you know, um, it's always interesting uh, to see. Now, we have a great relationship with the city, first of all, and our city counselors. So, Ernie, I'd love to bring you in on this conversation um, to just kind of give us your thoughts. And if there's any questions for Stephanie, that'd be great. Well, I, I can just tell you this is, you know, the city council, pre-COVID, you know, people could attend the meetings, um, and you'd have a lot of public input, uh, public statements, uh, which you know I think is highly affected by this pandemic and uh, everything associated with that. Which you know to me is a real negative because you know the city council serves for the people that it represents in those districts, and not being able to really hear from them, they hear from them, but not in the you know the formal uh, convenience of a of a public meeting like that. And, I, I tell you what, it's a lot of work. Uh, you all, uh, Stephanie, you got a lot of work to do. I mean, the legislature in New Mexico works 30 days and 60 days a year. Of course, they have interim committee meetings and stuff like that, but the city council is year round um, and it has uh, other committees that meet. And uh, so it's, a, it's more than a full-time job, Stephanie. I'm sure you have plenty to do all the time. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, uh, Lawrence Rael uh, used to be the, I think back in the day when I was following city council was the uh, assistant uh, chief of staff or something. I mean, whatever he was um, for the mayor, he, he was in the junior position, not to where he got to the, the and, you know, so I would, you know, represent PM. I would stay the entire meetings of the city council. And sometimes I would be the only person there watching. And finally, you know, he would come in and sit next to me and go like, what are you doing here? And I tell him, my boss said, as long as those counselors are there, I need to be there. <laughs> so 
Uh, you know what? It's an amazing amount of work that the city council has to do. And uh, people take it for granted. It's not an easy job. I always, when I first meet new city councilors or any elected, I always go, uh, what were you thinking? You know, because their entire life has changed. You know, they no longer can go to the grocery store without somebody saying, hey, what about this? Or they get calls at night. Um, it's, it's a full-time job that they, 24 seven, that they have to deal with. And it is public service. And people don't realize that a lot of times that uh, if you don't, uh, you know, you don't think they do much, just try to follow them for one day and all the things that they do. So I'm, a, uh, I'm really appreciative of the work of the city council. Uh, I think they represent the city well. Um, it's uh, nonpartisan, which makes it interesting. Um, and, uh, you know, there's going to be a, a pretty good turnover this year uh, based on the people that retired. So that's always interesting as well. And I, what do we know when the candidates, when is the last filing day for the candidates? Because I was looking up the candidates and I, you know, I noticed there's, you know, I don't even see the incumbents listed yet as people that are, you know. I, th I think it's coming up pretty soon, isn't it, Ethan? I don't pay much attention to those dates. But. Yes, and I should, I should have it right in front of me. I, I don't have my candidate guide right in front of me, but I would say that right now the exploratory period for publicly financed council candidates has just started. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot of um, candidates jumping in right now. There is a later period when individuals who are running privately financed can jump in. Oh. Um, we do see pretty strong interest in public finance uh, here in Albuquerque. So, but there is also candidates in the past who've run privately financed, and um, so there are both. And but that's going to be later, um, a little later in the spring. And so, um, but it's all happening right now. I mean, this late. You know, late spring, early summer is really when our our campaign cycle starts. So. And Ethan, would you mind just explaining for the public um, the difference between the two, a public uh, finance versus a private finance, and the importance of it, and why uh, we track that and know about that, like the importance behind what you do. So we um, so publicly financed candidates are candidates who during the public finance um, qualifying contribution period, gather a number of um, qualifying contributions, which are $5. They gather these $5 contributions over a period of around 30 days. And um, if they get the right number of qualifying contributions, they receive a effectively a grant to cover their campaign costs during the election. Um, and so if they, if they qualify, they're able to use that grant to that grant of money to run their campaign, and they can they don't really have to do any other fundraising than that. They just gather the qualifying contributions, and that's it. Um, candidates who want to run privately financed can gather um, private contributions. Um, I think our contribution limit here in Albuquerque is around. Um, I'll have to find that and come back to it, but it's I'm blanking on it offhand, but it's. Um, you know, there's a separate limit for contributions and if they just can gather really as many as they'd like and run on that money and it's um it's just a different way of running um i think um you know there's a lot of debate around public finance nationally i think the argument one of the arguments around it is it allows um, candidates to be to not have to um really do as much fundraising and free them to sort of vote on policy matters without um, having engaged with lots of interest groups and things like that. So, yes, I could. Yeah, we could definitely see how that would be <clears throat> a different a different workload for sure. <laughs> but you know, it, they have the choice, obviously, uh, to do what works for them in their campaigns. And so, it's our job as the voters to you know do our research and know um, and know who's running and what their what their um, you know background qualifications, whatever it is that you're looking for, that that information is available. Now, Ethan, where can where can the public go? This might be for Stephanie. I'm not sure. Where can they go to find out who the candidates are? How often is it updated? And then, um, you know, is there is there links for them to find all this? Where do they go? So yeah, if they go to our city clerk webpage, we currently have information about all the candidates who are running in this election. Um, as of this time, we actually don't know as of this point whether or not there are going to be any privately financed council or mayoral candidates. Um, but so if they just go to um, 
if you just Google the Office of the City Clerk in Albuquerque or you search for it on Yahoo or a browser, it'll take you there. And then we have a link for elections and you can search around there and there's um, a whole range of information. Um, you can also look at the, um, the dates and also information for um, members of the public just generally. So. Okay, perfect. We'll uh, we'll make sure that they have that too. Um, that way, um, you know, they're able to to do that and research that on their own and stay on top of it on their own. Um, so, I Stephanie, yes, this? please do. Uh, and just because it's on the, uh, this is a related topic, and and I'll forget later because I've got really quite hair. So, um, <laughs> if, if, if I recall, if somebody does something publicly financed. Um, and then somebody does privately financed. There is a limit on how much you get publicly financed. But then if the privately financed exceeds, like the other candidate, uh, raises twice the amount than the public uh, finance person, then all of a sudden the public finance person gets the same amount of money or something like that. Is it um, something like it's something weird like that? We used to have a matching provision in our charter, and we know um, due to some federal Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision, oh. that provision is no longer in effect. Okay. So, yeah. So then there's a cap on on their on the public finance amount, whereas if they're privately financed, they need to do their own fundraising. Whatever they come up with, they come up with. Correct. Okay. And that's interesting too, because I wasn't aware of that. So uh, that's always interesting, especially if you're not in politics or don't ever plan to run for office in your life. This is always good information to know. Uh, you know, kudos to politicians, because there's no way. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so, Stephanie, I'd like to uh, kind of jump back to you a little bit now. COVID absolutely changed the landscape of uh, the world, but of our local city council. And Ernie touched base on it just briefly, but I can imagine the frustration and, and stress that it put on city council and also the public who was used to being able to go voice their opinion. So let's talk a little bit about how COVID changed your department and uh, what have you learned? Is there anything that you would continue moving forward with and what are some things we're looking forward to getting back to doing? <laughs> sure, yes, you're, you're totally right. It, not only you know put it uh, affected all of the city, but our our department especially because we are so constituent facing forward. I mean, the, it's all about constituents here. So they weren't able to come into our office and get information and ask questions. They weren't able to be here in in person to tell the counselors what they're thinking. Um, we had to learn really quickly how to use Zoom and how to do that in a way that we could still include the public. However, um, of course, you know, with technology and everything, not everybody's able to get on to our Zoom calls. And so we have had we have seen a big decrease in the amount of public commenters. Um, we've we've tried to compensate for that by allowing people to send in email comments and they're not limited they can be as long as they want we do provide those comments to the counselors at the meetings as well um, and they're also um, subject to ipra so we can give those out um, I, we are very very looking forward to be able to come in back into the chambers downstairs and hold public meetings the change though is gonna be, of course, now we know we can do virtual meetings. We can do meetings that are hybrid, virtual and in-person. So we've actually um, just are finishing some upgrades down at Chambers. We're gonna start using a WebEx system that will allow us to both be there in person and, and maybe some of the counselors can attend virtually as well as the public. So we're trying to sort that out. And before it goes live, we'll make sure that it works and everybody's aware of how 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 that procedure will work. But I, I'm really hoping we can get there by maybe August at the latest. So. Yes, no, that would be really, really great. And I think we've all learned that we are gonna use some sort of a hybrid between virtual and in person as we move forward, um, because it, it does it did change the way we communicate. But I'm with you, Stephanie, ready to get back to the in person. It seems so much easier, but that's just me being 
a social butterfly. So I, I love the in-person. Um, same with you, Ethan. Now, you guys have had to make a lot of changes. Now, people walking in, requesting records, and all the different things that that, that uh, the clerk's office does. So give us uh, some, uh, you know, a few things that you had to change with the systems were concerned. And is there anything that worked that you're going to continue to do using forward in, inside your department? Um, absolutely. Thank you. We, a couple things, um, like the council, we found um, that board and commission hearings really are, have been, um, while there has been, I think the challenge of facilitating access for people who do not have internet access, um, there has also, I think in a way, been an increase in interest in certain boards because it has made it sort of easier to attend for some people. Um, and so we have seen um, a lot of interest in our, so we've been conducting board and commission meetings for now about a year um, online and um, we have, um, heard some really positive feedback from, um, you know, members of the disability community who have a hard time getting out, and um, they've really found, enjoyed it. And so I think we, we like council, are um, we manage three boards here in my office, and we are trying to, you know, learn the best way to kind of um, get the most out of, you know, Zoom hearings and or Zoom board hearings, and um, but at the same time figure out new ways to accommodate the public who does not have internet access. So. We don't know quite where we're going to land on that yet, but the um, board and commission meetings via Zoom has been a great thing. I will also say we're doing most of our most, if not all, of our hearings via Zoom. So now, if you request a hearing, um, it'll likely be on Zoom, and I think that's also been made it slightly more accessible for the parties. It has made some hearings a little more challenging, um, like the hearings involving animals. Um, they've just gotten a little difficult, but. We're still managing them and then i will say one thing i've liked is we're now um, accepting appeals and um, service of process actually too i mean this is sort of a weird side note but if you're suing city please uh email us at summons and appeals.com at cabq.gov and um, same thing with the appeals if you have a uh, appeal of a permit or appeal of something else that you need to file um, electronically you can do it all electronically and we really enjoyed that and the, so the address for that is summons and appeals at cabq.gov. And um, we have been in the records realm. We've scanned, we've been scanning records now in my department for well over two years. And we're currently scanning right around um, 10 to 20,000 records per week. And it has, um, we've been really trying to go through and identify the types of records that people are requesting um, that don't have a lot of personal identifier information that we can make available online. So for example, we discovered there was a lot of interest in the, um, from, for, in certificates of occupancy. Um, commercial requesters were often looking for these just to move a construction project forward or for a variety of reasons. And so we've been working with the city's planning department to scan all of the commercial certificates of occupancy and make them all online so that you don't have to submit a public records request to get them and you can just go look them up. Um, we're working on a similar uh, project with um, underground storage tank inspection reports, which may not seem like the most exciting record, but we do get a lot of requests for them. And um, they don't contain any personal identifiers. And so we worked with the fire marshal's office to put all those online. And we're just constantly looking for projects like that because um, during the pandemic, you know, it's been clear that people do continue to need access to government records. And so we're looking for that kind of happy medium of records that are um, sort of a whole class of records that don't have personal identifiers that we can scan in a reasonable amount of time. So, so Ethan, that's, uh, that brings up this question that I have. So what is the most requested type of record you get inside of your office? And what's the most far-fetched crazy ask that you had for records? <laughs> Because uh, I well, can see people asking for records that are really old that maybe don't exist, but I'm trying to figure out what people are requesting. So I can tell you just a little bit about the breakdown of, you know, by law, I, I have no view on the purpose of the request, so I, I, I take no opinion as to crazy. Um, we, so the city receives about 9,000 requests for, uh, more than 9,000 requests for public records each year. Um, about 50 to 60% of those are for APD records. And frankly, a large portion of those are for tr related to traffic accidents. Um, oh. I think in part that's because um, there's two parties to usually to every traffic accident and usually they will both end up submitting a request. 
And so that kind of doubles the amount of work. We are able to kind of find them a little. Um, we try to identify them and screen them a little bit so we don't do double work. Um, but about 50% of the city's volume is for um, APD related requests. And um, behind that, there is a large number of requests we get for the planning, environmental health, and municipal development departments. These requests all tend to overlap because they tend to relate to commercial development projects. Um, in particular, they seem to revolve around phase one environmental site assessments because mm -hmm. it's my opinion that in order to conduct a phase yeah. environmental site assessment, you have to do research on the history of the property and any environmental violations. And so um, we do get a lot of requests for those and we are, and those are um, our biggest target really for this, for our scanning work because um, most of the records associated with um, phase one environmental site assessments don't contain any personal identifier information. And so, you know, we're hoping, with, hoping within the next few years to really make those all available online if we can. So, oh, wow. That will also help cut back the amount of traffic of people coming to the to the space. And again, COVID teaching some interesting little ways, you know, to to watch that. Um, that's uh, so that would be awesome to be able to go online and find some of the stuff we need. So good luck. We we encourage that highly. <clears throat> so you know, Ernie, I kind of want to to ask you. We have you know, uh, a great, like I said, a great relationship with the city and we do have a great relationship with city council. I think that that's so important for our, our organization, any business organization to understand what's happening within the city um, as much as possible that affects small business. But, um, you know, we know that uh, small business is in the middle of economic recovery right now as much as possible. And uh, I know that we've had some, um, some collaboration, I guess you could say, with um, with city council on this. So Ernie, if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. And, and it, it all is about PPE. And uh, so the city council had to vote this past year on, you know, spending some money uh, to get PPE to small businesses uh, and then even kind of smaller businesses, you know, businesses with less than five employees to make sure that uh, they have uh, the equipment that they need to, um, you know, keep their business open as much as they could have it open at the time. And, you know, without stuff that they really can really afford or um, may not be able to find, because remember, there was a big rush for all kinds of stuff uh, when COVID started. I mean, geez. Um, so we were, uh, you know, one of the entities that the city council uh, funded uh, with PPE equipment and uh, distribution, a little bit of uh, money to help distribute it because it takes you know personnel time and storage <laughs> we got a bunch still <laughs> so uh happy to happy to report that because uh we've been fortunate here at the chamber to have received um you know a lot of ppe from other sources um to distribute it to small business because they they know our connection to small business here in, in albuquerque and throughout new mexico uh, and together with uh, the contract we have with Be Well and M, uh, you know, we're trying to distribute this to appropriate folks. Um, but it's a good thing. Like I said, that, I mean, they get a lot of equipment in those bags. There's all kinds of stuff that uh, is helpful to these small businesses uh, without them having to pay for it, which is a big thing. So, yeah, we've been we've, we've uh, enjoyed the collaboration with the city council. And uh, like I said, it's we appreciate uh, all that they do because it's not an easy job, I'm telling you. Um, so I, I am hopeful though, here and today, that, 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 that I'm, I'm really hopeful, gosh, post pandemic, that city council, that there's not a hybrid. <laughs> I really am hopeful that you get to, if you're gonna go to a city council meeting uh, and you wanna participate publicly, I'm hoping that the councilors will be there as well. Uh, I think it's just so, I think some business needs to really be done in person, face to face, where body language is seen better than Zoom. And, um, you know, and, and, and you can see the effect of a lot of people, perhaps at the city council meetings and uh, representing a particular issue. I, I think it's always important. Um, so I'm hopeful that I know hybrid has been pretty good for a lot of things, but uh, I'm hopeful that, and also the state legislature, I would just think that would be horrible if, if we couldn't be able to talk to legislators 
uh, in, at the Capitol when you need to see them. So, but we'll see how that goes. I guess you guys are the, the smart ones that have to put this all together. Good luck with that. Um, yeah, well, Mr. C. The Buck, I'm, I'm really hoping, I, I think most of my current counselors want to be present and next to their constituents. I'm hoping the hybrid um, scenario will only be used by them when they're traveling and they don't want to miss a meeting. Um, that's where I would like it to go. Well, and Ernie's a little a little old school government relations because that's his background and he likes that camaraderie, which I think everybody does when you really need to connect with somebody on an issue and you just want them to see and hear the passion you have about something that's important to you or affects you, whether it's in your business or in, in, in the organization or in community, whatever that may be. And so, um, yeah, it's going to be nice to get back to somewhat the new normal, whatever that may be <clears throat> from all of this past year. So as we start to kind of wind down the hour, um, I wanted to kind of go back to Stephanie here just a little bit. And, you know, there's been a lot of changes this year uh, with, with you, uh, with your departments and all the departments. Um, what is something that you're just super proud of that you can say about your department um, and, and your staff and the way that everybody has adjusted? Um, well, as, as you can guess, the, the staff of the city council has to be, first of all, very professional and very capable because we have a big job to do. Um, so I'm lucky in that everybody who works in this office is just that. Um, they, I have a wide range of expertise that I can pull from. Um, I would say that, though, the most important thing that I've learned during this past year is that we have to rely on those people that actually manage the processes. So I'm talking about our clerk of council, Miss Ortega. She works closely with the city clerk and she's responsible for getting out those agendas, making sure we make public notices. Um, she almost seems like a nag to me, you know, but that's her job. She needs to make sure these things get done. And, um, you know, without her, this uh, honestly, this office couldn't run um, or, or someone like her. Um, so super shout out to Crystal out there. We, we love you. We need you. <laughs> yes. um, of course, then I have a I have an associate director, Mr. Melendres, who is a lawyer. I am actually a CPA. I'm not a lawyer myself. And so I, I he's our, our legal advisor here for the counselors. And I do rely on his expertise a lot. Um, uh, um, each counselor, actually, when they get a point uh, elected, they get to choose a policy analyst that terms with them. So they each have what we call a policy analyst that receives their, e helps them with their emails, helps them set up meetings, helps them draft legislation. So that's also very helpful. Um, so that I do have another complement of just regular policy analysts that I supervise, but it is always helpful to have that one person assigned to each counselor. So. Yeah, and you do have some great policy analysts. We've had the pleasure of working with, if not one, all of them mm -hmm. over the past few years, for sure. And so um, <clears throat> a great team. Uh, same with you, Ethan. What is something that you're just real proud of for your department over this past year and, and moving forward? Thank you. I, you know, it's been such an ins uh, a challenge you can say here. It. Yeah, I was going to say insane, but it, it's, you can it's say really, insane. <laughs> you know, I think at, at the beginning of the pandemic, I would just say that um, we were confronted with a situation we'd never, um, at least in my department, had never really confronted before, which was just really needing to suddenly shift to working from home. And um, I don't know that we really knew whether it was going to work. Uh, and we needed, we knew we needed to try and do it. And so we, um, we worked to make, get everyone set up so they could work from home. And it, I guess I'm just proud of the fact that it did generally work. I mean, we closed 9,000 requests for public records last year. Wow. We handled numerous um, hearings. I, I don't know specifically how many, but we did them all via Zoom. And um, so, you know, we are everywhere along this way. We did learn things. And I think there are little pieces that we're going to keep. But in general, I'm just most proud of the fact that it just it, it worked and we were able to survive and we're still here. And we scanned a lot of records as well. We scanned probably half a million records last year. And so it, um, you know, and I think we're definitely going to keep, it turned out our scanning was actually more efficient when we did it with two teams, one at home, one in the office. And so that, I think we're actually going to keep the sort of semi telecommuting work that we have in the scanning center. Um, and um, but yeah, it's been, it's been a really interesting experience and a really interesting time to work in local government. 
Uh, Ethan, did you find that you you were getting more work done inside of that time? Maybe because people weren't coming into the office. So just being curious, because I've heard from a lot of departments that are like, we've used this time to get a lot of work done. And I thought that was interesting. Well, so the um, we've had so many changes in a couple of my different program areas, like hearings and IPRA, that it's hard to have good data to compare. With scanning, though, I've had the same team doing similar work for such a long time that it, we had a great data set to compare. And so I do know that it actually was significantly more efficient to have them change their workflow. And they went from basically um, each working on their own scanning projects where they would scan stuff and then they would do the data entry to they divided it up and then they had one person doing scanning and one person doing data entry. Mm -hmm. And that was probably 20 to 30% more efficient. And so um, wow. I, think, I think we're gonna keep that. Well, I think it's always interesting. I, I love hearing about people's best practices and what's worked for them because it really helps um, other people that are watching to go, hey, maybe I should consider doing that or, oh, that has worked for us as well. And then it kind of becomes the new normal. So I'm always interested in that. And speaking of best practices, do you guys, uh, well, I should say, is the departments themselves individually or are you a part of any associations of like city clerks or associations of council services for these best practices that you have been able to collaborate with during this time? Yeah, so I know on the council side, our, our clerk is a member of the Municipal Clerks Association, as probably Ethan and some of his staff. Um, our counselors, though, actually rely on, a, it's the, they call it Naleo, I think. And it's a large uh, convening of uh, local governments. Um, and so I, I do, we do send a few counselors to those seminars each year. Although last, actually the, the right before COVID started, my last batch of counselors had just came back from that conference. And so um, they, they likely holding it virtually this year. But. Yeah. yeah, we're still in the virtual, but we'll go back to in-person soon. Ethan, same question for you. Yes, I've, I am a member of the uh, International Municipal Clerks um, Association, and um, it's been pretty helpful during the pandemic. I think what it's been most helpful for is just how to transition to teleworking. Um, that's their insights on that have been helpful. Well, I know that, uh, you know, here at the Hispano Chamber, we are uh, lucky and, and blessed to be involved with chambers from around the country. And it's always very interesting to just, even if we have it on in the background and we're listening to either a webinar or somebody speaking, to hear about all the best practices that people are doing in and around the area of chamber work or in whatever direct industry you're in, to hear about what's working. And sometimes I hear it and I'm thinking, hey, we're doing that, so that's a good thing. Or, hey, that's a great idea, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> you know, so always having those best practices is great. Well, we're almost out of time, and I think we need to start to close up by what is the best way, um, Stephanie, that somebody could get in touch with the counselors, with you directly? How do we start putting this information out there so that people can do um, uh, a little bit of reach out if they need to? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have a front desk that's staffed from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, whether or not she's in person here or at home. And our front desk, no I'm sorry, <clears throat> our front desk number is 505-768-3100. And Kayla is our receptionist. She can get to you to anybody uh, at, for any question you have. Wonderful. Um, you can also visit our website on the city site. It's uh, www.cabq.gov slash council, C-O-U-N-C-I-L. And that'll bring you to our council page. There's lots of information there, a list of your counselors. You can uh, look up who your counselor is based on your address um, and lots of other, other information, how to get a hold of me and everybody else, so. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, same question uh, for you, Ethan. I think the best way to get in contact with us, uh, the same is just call our front desk. We're a very small office. And so, you know, we can, uh, our front desk can route you where they need to go. The number at our front desk is 924-3650. And we can also be reached at email. It's cityclerk at cabq.gov. Yeah, the emails are always really great. Um, so we'll make sure that they have that information. And Ernie, before we go, any last minute comments or questions you have for our panelists today? Oop. 
I hit the wrong button. Wrong button. <laughs> Still learning Zoom. I'm That's still his learning Zoom. Okay. <laughs> no, I, 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 I tell you what, we, you know, we could have done another hour to tell you the truth about uh, stuff in the city council, like, you know, the bills, how you can try to locate bills on the, on the internet and the process. I mean, it really is, uh, there's a lot to uh, local government, to uh, the city council part of local government and all the things that they do and all the various committees. I know you have several committees. So um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn uh, by paying attention to what's going on at the city council because it does affect your life and it affects sometimes your pocketbook. Um, but and hey, <laughs> it, yeah, exactly. But hey, uh, I really appreciate you all uh, coming on and doing this, taking the time. It's, I always find it interesting. So I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I also learned today how much interface the city clerk's office has with city council, um, because you don't really know all of the background. You know what the departments do like in theory, but what do they really do and how you, uh, two, your two departments interact so much and how you have much so much responsibility to each other. So that was a, a really great um, lesson for us today. So I wanna say a huge thank you to Stephanie and Ethan who are joining us today from the city clerk's office and of course the Office of the City Council. Um, it's been really uh, eye-opening to learn new things as we always do with all of these departments. If you have questions out there and you would like to continue to reach out to do so, you can reach them through the website, cabq.gov backslash council. Um, I think the other one was probably backslash is at city clerks. Um, we'll, we'll make sure that you have that. You can always call 311 and ask to be transferred, but stay in touch. The point here is if you are a small business, if you are a citizen of the city, ask the questions. That's what this is there for. Reach out. They want to hear from you. And they'll do their best to get your question answered um, and, and, and as timely as they can. Remember, people are still working remote. We're still not 100% open, but we are here for you just like we are here at the Albuquerque Espano Chamber. So just want to remind everybody again, a huge thank you to uh, the city of Albuquerque and the mayor's office and the Choose One campaign, which is something that we have been uh, heavily involved with since last year. Um, you can always choose to volunteer. You can always choose to uh, maybe uh, apply with the city for a position. There's so much to learn uh, by going to the website. We'll make sure that's in this uh, post as well. And remember, stay tuned. We still have a couple of weeks left of uh, getting to know your city departments. Wednesday, we will be back on the lunch hour with a whole new couple of departments to break down. And want to tell everybody, have a great week. It's beautiful outside in our Duke City. We hope that you get out and enjoy our beautiful weather, our trails, our incredible city. Uh, do a little home, home site tourism, if you will, because that's another industry that's been hugely hit. And we hope that you get out and support those businesses that much much need you right now so everybody have a fantastic afternoon and a great week and we will see you on wednesday thank you again stephanie and ethan bye everybody